Welcome back to the Deep Dive. Today, we're digging into something, well, something that's really quite strange. We've got an object out in space that seems to be uh, bending the rules, ignoring gravity almost. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 3 ik -LAS. That's right. The second interstellar visitor we've really tracked. And yeah, it's behaving in ways that, well, they just don't quite fit the standard physics playbook. Exactly. So for this deep dive, we're really zeroing in on the absolute latest data coming in about 3 ik -LAS. Our mission, if you like, is to really unpack the implications of its uh, its recently measured non-gravitational acceleration. Non-gravitational, meaning it's being pushed by something other than gravity. Precisely. And we have some critical new calculations about just how much mass would need to be involved if this is, you know, a natural thing. Plus, there's a big observation campaign coming up, kind of a definitive test. Okay. So is it evaporation, a natural comet explanation? Or uh, does the data maybe point towards something like a technological signature? Right. Let's start with the numbers then. The observation that really kicked this off, October 29th, 2025, data from LMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Yes. And it showed three ITLAs wasn't quite where it was supposed to be. Exactly. If it was only influenced by gravity, it should have been in position A. But LMA found it four arc seconds away from that. In right ascension, it had drifted. Four arc seconds. Now, that might sound incredibly small to most people listening. It does sound small, yeah. But in space, over those distances. That four arc second deviation is, well, it's everything. It implies a constant sustained push acting on the object, something besides gravity. Okay, so how much of a push are we talking about? When you actually quantify it, it translates to a non-gravitational acceleration, we usually just call it a row, of roughly 0 0.02 millimeters per second squared. 0 0.02 millimeters per second squared. Again, sounds negligible, like absolutely tiny. It is tiny, compared to, say, the acceleration of gravity here on Earth. So why is that tiny number such a big deal out there? Because space is essentially frictionless. There's no air resistance, nothing really slowing things down naturally. So even a minuscule constant push applied over millions and millions of kilometers of this thing travels, uh -huh. it adds up. It integrates over time into a really noticeable deviation from the purely gravitational path. Ah, uh, I see. It's like the difference between just coasting and having a tiny, tiny engine running constantly. That's a good analogy, yeah. The object is being pushed consistently. And if that push is natural, it demands a really significant counterforce. Okay, so let's chase that natural path first. Comets, outgassing. Right, the standard explanation. If 3 i Telus is basically, you know, a big dirty snowball, yeah. and this push comes from ice turning into gas and shooting off like little jets. S sublimation, yes. How do we figure out how much ice, how much mass it would have to lose to create that 0 0.02 millimeter hope push? What's the physics there? It actually boils down to a pretty fundamental principle, conservation of momentum. Okay. Newton's law's territory. Exactly. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The force pushing the object forward, that tiny acceleration, yeah. must be balanced by the force of the material being ejected backwards. So mathematically, it's the object's total mass times its acceleration yeah. equals the rate at which it's losing mass, dmdt deal, times the speed of that ejected gas and we have an idea of how fast that gas would be moving. We make a reasonable assumption. For gas sublimating off a comet at this distance from the sun, the ejection speed is typically low, less than a few hundred meters per second, sort of thermal speeds for molecules. Okay, so you take the measured acceleration, you assume a plausible gas speed. Hmm. What does the calculation tell you about the mass loss? And this is where it gets, well, pretty dramatic. To account for that constant 0 0.02 millimeter osimeter acceleration, Three I-8 Teelers must have shed at least one-sixth of its entire mass. One-sixth? Yes. During the roughly month-long period it took to cross its perihelion distance, that's about 203 million kilometers. Hold on. One-sixth of its total mass mm -hmm. in just a month. It's an astonishing amount of required volatility. Just think about that. A sixth of its structure just gone. Vaporized in 30 days. That sounds incredibly violent. If it's made of ice and rock, wouldn't losing that much material you know, maybe tear it apart oh, yeah. or at least change how it looks dramatically. That's a really good point. And it's one of the challenges. If the outgassing wasn't smooth, if it came from specific vents or pockets, yeah. you'd expect perhaps really strong localized jets that could potentially destabilize the whole object, make it tumble, or at least create a very uneven lopsided gas cloud. But the measurement is for a steady average acceleration. Correct. So for the calculation, we have to work with that average. Now, let's put some scale on this mass loss. We had 
earlier estimates, you know, before this recent acceleration measurement from the Webb telescope data before October 2025. Uh-huh. I remember that. That suggested 3i at less was already losing maybe 150 kilograms per second, which in turn implied its total mass was probably at least 33 billion tons. 33 billion tons to start yep. with. Okay. So if it started around that mass and it needs to lose one-sixth of it to explain this recent acceleration. Let me do the math. One sixth of 33 billion is. Wow. It means the cloud of gas required to generate that push must contain at least 5.5 billion tons of material. Five and a half billion tons mm. of gas. Yes. That's what the cometary hypothesis demands must be there surrounding the object right now. That's hard to visualize. How much is that? Think about the Great Pyramid of Giza. Now imagine about a thousand of them. Okay. Now imagine vaporizing all thousand pyramids into gas and dust and spreading that cloud out in space around three I at lace. That's the scale of material we're talking about. 5.5 billion tons. A thousand vaporized pyramids. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That that definitely sets the stage for a test, doesn't it? It absolutely does. The physics is basically shouting, there must be an enormous gas cloud. Yeah. So the next question is obvious. Can we see it? Are we looking? We are. And we have a really prime opportunity coming up very soon. The object makes its closest approach to Earth on December 19th, 2025. Cool. Still quite far, about 269 million kilometers. But that's our best viewing angle, our clearest shot. And telescopes will be pointed its way. Oh, yes. Yeah. Big time. The International Asteroid Warning Network, IAWNPO, they've recognized how critical this is. They've coordinated a major extended monitoring campaign. IAWN. Okay, when does that run? It covers a two-month window, starts November 27th, 2025, and runs right through to January 27th, 2026. Two full months of observation. What are they looking for? We're talking Hubble, Webb. Big ground-based telescope. All of the above. Hundreds of instruments, really. And they're looking for one primary thing. The signature of that massive gas cloud. That 5.5 billion tons of material. The thousand vaporized pyramids. Exactly. If that non-gravitational push is really caused by cometary evaporation, by outgassing, then that gas must be there. It has to be dense enough and extensive enough for these world-class telescopes to detect it. It's a straightforward test, then. See the gas, it's likely a comet. Don't see the gas. Then the comet hypothesis has a serious, serious problem. This is the litmus test. Physics demands the gas cloud. The telescopes need to find it. But could the gas be there, but maybe just too spread out? Or maybe in a form that's hard to detect, even for Webb or Hubble? Is a non-detection absolutely definitive? That's a fair question. But based on everything we know about comets, and especially based on what we saw, or rather didn't see, with Umua. Ah, uh, yes, the first visitor. We are pretty confident. Gas being shed at the rate required to produce this kind of acceleration, billions of tons over a month, should create a detectable coma or tail. If 5.5 billion tons of gas is spread out so thinly that our absolute best instruments can't see it, uh -huh. then it simply wouldn't have enough density to exert the measured force in the object in the first place. The required push and the detectability are linked. I see. The physics that demands the gas also demands that the gas be visible, essentially. Yeah. In essence, yes. So the bottom line is, if the IAWN campaign comes back empty-handed, if they don't find evidence of this massive gas cloud, then, well, cometary evaporation just can't be the natural explanation for the observed acceleration. It fails the test. So if the test fails, if the gas isn't there, where does that leave us? It forces us down the other path. If the natural explanation doesn't hold up, then the reported non-gravitational acceleration has to be considered as potentially a technological signature. Meaning some kind of propulsion system. An engine, effectively. That's the implication, yes. Something actively pushing the object other than escaping gas. And like you said, this feels familiar. We've been here before, haven't we, with one eye Oumuma? We have. It's a striking parallel. Oumuma also showed that non-gravitational acceleration. It was also deviating from a purely gravity-driven path. And we looked hard for gas around Oumuma, right? With Spitzer. Extremely hard. Deep observations with the Spitzer Space Telescope, and nothing was found. No gas, no dust cloud to explain the push. So what did the scientific community conclude then? Well, this is where it gets a bit um, awkward conceptually. Some comet experts essentially define Oumuamua as a dark comet. A dark comet. Yes. Which, if you think about it, is almost an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. How so? Because the very definition of a comet, what makes it a comet visually, is the coma and tail. 
the visible cloud of gas and dust created by that sublimation process. Right. The tail is the signature. Exactly. So calling something a dark comet because it has acceleration without a visible tail, it's like saying you have a silent alarm. It sort of misses the defining characteristic. So they were basically classifying it based on the acceleration, which could be comet-like, but ignoring the missing evidence, the lack of gas. That's one way to put it. It felt a bit like forcing it into a known category, even if it didn't quite fit. It reminds me of that analogy like a cave dweller finding a smartphone and classifying it as just an unusual rock because they don't have a category for technology. Mm, that's an interesting comparison. You classify based on the framework you have, even if the data is anomalous. So if 3 eyes less turns out the same way it shows the acceleration, but the IAWM campaign finds no gas, just sticking with the dark comet label seems, well, scientifically unsatisfying maybe? like avoiding the weird data? It certainly pushes the boundaries of that concept. If we have two interstellar objects showing acceleration without gas, the dark comet idea starts to look less like an explanation and more like perhaps a placeholder for something we don't understand yet. Which brings us to how people are talking about 3 I Atlas right now. Yes, the current discourse. We've seen some you know, prominent science communicators, people like Brian Cox, stating quite forcefully that 3 I Atlas is definitely a natural comet. Right. There have been strong statements made in the popular science sphere. But doesn't this highlight a key difference between, say, popularizing science and doing the actual research? I think it does. You have researchers like Avi Loeb, for example, who are actively engaged with the raw data, publishing papers, analyzing the anomalies. Loeb mentioned he's written, what, 11 scientific papers specifically on 3 Atlas recently? That's correct. 11 papers digging into the data, the calculations, the implications. Meanwhile, Popularizers making definitive statements often haven't published scientific papers on that specific object. So it comes down to following the data, wherever it leads, even if it's uncomfortable or strange, which is what science is supposed to do, right? Precisely. Scientific progress often hinges on paying close attention to anomalies, the things that don't fit the standard model. You can't just dismiss them because they're inconvenient. And with 3 i -ALIS, it's not just the acceleration, is it? There are other weird things. Correct. Loeb and others have pointed out there is something like nine distinct anomalies associated with three Ayelas already. Things that make it different from a typical comet? Nine. Like what? Well, the most recent one, the ninth, is this combination of it getting unprecedentedly brighter near perihelion. Okay, brighter makes sense if it's outgassing more. But at the same time, it became bluer than the sun. Bluer? Why is that weird for a comet? Because normally when comets outgas, they release dust along with the gas. And that dust tends to scatter sunlight in a way that makes the comet look slightly reddish, or at least not particularly blue. Oh. If 3 Atelus is getting brighter and bluer, it suggests it's reflecting more light, but perhaps shedding almost pure gas with very, very little dust. So an unusually clean comet, maybe? Perhaps. Or maybe it points to something else about its surface, or the way it interacts with sunlight. But the point is, you have to explain that the blueness and lack of dust alongside the demand for 5.5 billion tons of gas and the non-gravitational acceleration. It's a lot of strange pieces to fit together into one neat natural comet picture. It is, and just making broad statements doesn't really address these specific documented anomalies in the data. Okay, so wrapping this up, where does this leave us, and importantly you, the listener, as we look ahead? It feels like we're not just waiting for more data in general, we're waiting for the results of a very specific planned test. That's exactly right. The IAWN campaign, kicking off at the end of November, is really the crucible here. It's the decisive moment. The observations over those two months will either show us that 3 i Atlas is, indeed, the most incredibly volatile, gassy object we've ever seen, shedding a sixth of its mass in a month while somehow remaining dark, or at least dust more, <laughs> or the lack of detected gas will provide the strongest evidence to date that its acceleration isn't natural that it requires a more, shall we say, exotic explanation, like an engineered source. So if those hundreds of telescopes stare at it for two months and come up empty, if they don't see those billions of tons of gas, mm. those vaporized pyramids. Then we have a really profound mystery, a genuine scientific puzzle. And that leads to our final thought for you to ponder. Yeah. If these extensive observations do confirm a non-detection of gas, mm -hmm. If the core physical requirement for the natural explanation just isn't met, how long can the idea of a dark comet really hold up scientifically? When do we have to start seriously grappling with the implications of a technological signature? What's the weakest link in that natural story right now? Something to think about until our next deep dive. <laughs>